Okay, so I'm going to give a kind of an overview today. This presentation will be an overview of a, a kind of a blog series that I called Madness in the Family, the three-part blog series that I posted on uh, maddenamerica.com uh, and elsewhere. And what I want to do here is just basically present the kind of main themes um, that I introduced and covered in that in those articles, and also kind of arrive at some very clear practical um, methods and tools for families and loved ones who are who are supporting people who are going through extreme states. So kind of that's that's what this is all about. Really, is is offering both a framework and a set of tools that I think are, are really helpful. Um, this isn't just my opinion. This is actually just coming from the recovery literature as well as my own personal experience. Um, so whenever we talk about psychosis, uh, what often happens is the term gets thrown around as if it's a very clear term, like an agreed upon term, and, and actually it could be further from the truth, really. It's, uh, the term psychosis is a very controversial term. Um, there's still so much about it we really don't understand. So I'm just going to, as a practice, I always begin, whenever I do any kind of presentations or articles on psychosis, I just give a brief definition of how I'm using the term. So I'm going to just do that real quickly first. So uh, to start with, I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, the mainstream of understanding and definition of psychosis. And what I mean by mainstream, I'm talking about sort of what we find in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders used by most uh, professionals in the, in the Western world, mental health professionals. Um, the ICD is a, a kind of a European version, which is quite similar in many ways. And these are the terms on this list that are used within those manuals. Um, they're not my preferred terms, but um, they're the ones that are generally used by professionals in the field. Delusions, hallucinations, uh, mania, or other apparently quote-unquote bizarre affect. They actually use the word bizarre in the DSM. Uh, at least they did in the DSM-4. I'm not really sure. I don't recall if they did in 5, but, but that's still the same, the same spirit of um, mania and extreme kind of emotional experiences, which which uh, result in these other kinds of experiences often. Illusions of grandeur is a term often used. Uh, paranoia, fear of being watched over by malevolent forces or entities. Uh, and catatonia, which refers to either bizarre movements that are difficult to understand for the observer um, or lack of movement altogether. And then the actual diagnoses we find, so going to the DSM here, that um, capture kind of the, these different main quote-unquote psychotic disorders. Uh, schizophrenia, and that has a number of different subtypes, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, mood disorders with psychotic features, so like such as major depression, for example, um, psychotic features, and delusional disorders. So these are kind of the main mainstream diagnoses we find that are pointing to psychotic conditions in the mainstream. And the general understanding um, within this framework, the mainstream framework, is that these are discrete entities, these are discrete dis disease entities, um, and that they each refer to a particular kind of disease, you know, uh, pathophysiological disease process occurring within the brain. So that's, that's generally the, the mainstream kind of understanding, and then of course that message goes out to, to the public. Um, pharmaceutical industry tends to promote this, uh, and then just the mainstream discourse and media also promotes this kind of view. Now, if you actually look at the recovery literature, we find a, a much more nuanced and far less black and white kind of understanding of what's actually going on here. So, for example, there's been extensive research done um, by the British Psychological Society, amongst others, to you know, try to see if there's validity to the idea of these discrete categories of, of psychotic uh, disease. And so schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and bipolar being the main sort of three hallmark kind of psychotic disorders. Uh, and what they found after pretty extensive meta-analysis is that it just simply doesn't fit in discrete categories at all. What we actually really find is a continuum of experience where you can say people who are having more kind of cognitive um, difficulties, you know, such as anomalous beliefs, perceptions, etc., are more on the schizophrenia side of the continuum. Those who are having anomalous or extreme emotional experiences, what often is what's called mania or severe depression with, with psychotic features on the bipolar disorder side. And then schizoaffective, um, actually representing the people who have a combination of both. And, and truth is actually the vast majority, and probably almost everybody, has some com who has these kinds of psychotic conditions has some kind of combination from what I've seen in the literature and in my practice. Um, but that 
a given individual that, you know, over the course of, of going through these experiences, they often might swing from one side to the other a bit, and, um, or one particular individual might be more generally on one side of the spectrum than the other, but there's no clear sort of black and white categorical kind of boundaries really that fit for that. Now, again, if we take that whole top continuum there in that slide, and let's just give it a name, we'll call it madness, just to give it a name. And if we actually compare those experiences with the mainstream population, so people we generally consider sane, you know, not, not quote unquote mad, not having psychosis, psychosis, again, we find a continuum. At this, this time, we're going to call it a sanity madness continuum, where people on the right side of those having you know, more and more extreme states, and those on the left side are having less extreme states, experience, less experiences that could be diagnosed uh, with a psychotic disorder. And again, no really clear boundary between these. Again, we really find more of a continuum of natural human experience. So kind of taking that continuum a little bit further, kind of expanding that, I think it's helpful to use the term consensus reality. So consensus reality is the idea that any particular society or group or tribe is going to have a general kind of agreed upon reality. Like this is the way things are. These are considered normal beliefs. These are normal perceptions. Um, and so I'm calling that consensus reality. And so if someone within that community um, basically experiences no anomalous experiences, no significant beliefs or perceptions that fall outside of the generally kind of agreed norm, and they're, we would say they're on the far left of this continuum, and then as they start to have more, as people have more and more extreme experiences, uh, anomalous experiences that are kind of coming more to the right here, and people all the way to the right, you know, further to the right, we find people who have such extreme anomalous experiences that um, they actually become quite, un they often become very unstable. Um, they can become very distressing for that person and the person around them. And so for my own definition, it's only the rightmost part of this continuum that I'm actually going to call psychosis. People who are experiencing significant um, anomalous experiences which are distressing and, and likely to be unstable in some way. I think if someone's having anomalous experiences that, that aren't distressing, um, aren't causing problems to self or others that I don't think it's helpful to call that psychosis. And, and I, even though generally in the mainstream they do, and I think that's a real problem, so I just want to make it clear I'm actually just speaking to the people on the far right, and I'm calling it a psychotic process because I actually believe that at a certain point there's actually a process that kind of gets initiated, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So this is kind of where I shift into, well, what causes psychosis? And again, this is a very loaded, controversial question, but I think I can put it in a frame that I think will be helpful and that uh, generally most people who work in the field, especially who kind of see psychosis from a more psychosocial orientation, um, generally agree with this kind of broad frame that I'm going to present here. <clears throat> so first of all, it helps to look at the... So before we even talk about psychosis, let's just think about the development of a healthy, a healthy self. And I also call that a personal paradigm. So if we kind of consider our life development from, from birth or even pre-birth all the way forward you know, so until the present day, we can kind of look at, at the development of our experience of self in the world, our understanding of self in the world, uh, what I often call our personal paradigm. We can look at that like a skyscraper. And in the early days, you know, in, in the kind of early development of self, very foundation floors of the skyscraper, we find two very core kind of dilemmas that we have to kind of make some degree of peace with. That's what I call the existential dialectic and the relational dialectic. And then as we continue to develop sort of all the other experiences and understandings eventually kind of get stacked on top of these and we end up with a very elaborate kind of personal paradigm. And in psychosis, I believe it's these very bottom most layers which are particularly relevant. I'll say more about that in a minute. So going through the two, these two bottom sort of fundamental layers of, of the experience of the self, the very first one we might call the existential dialectic. So if, if you imagine a little infant coming into the world, you know, the, the very first thing that has to happen for that infant to feel, uh, you know, it's essentially for that infant to develop a healthy well-being, we'll say, is that, that infant needs to feel welcome. They need to feel that the world is safe enough, that I'm welcome here, um, and then my existence is valued. So these are kind of these just basic core needs that that infant needs. If those needs aren't met, that infant's really going to struggle. Um, so I'm kind of calling those peace needs and existence needs. So arriving at the experience of myself as a relatively secure and stable being living in a relatively secure and predictable world. So the core beliefs, ideally, that get set up here, and these aren't just cognitive beliefs, these are actually deep organismic beliefs, like held within the fabric of one's being. 
I have a right to exist and take up space. Life is meaningful. The world is safe enough. It's fundamentally whole and healthy. So this is healthy development. And as this gets developed and the infant begins to <clears throat> differentiate more and more, kind of separate from feeling unified with mom and unified with the world, and begins to experience uh, more of a distinction between self and other, we kind of come into the second dialectic, but I'm calling the relational dialectic. So as we experience self and other more and more distinctly, then two other categories of needs really show up. I'm calling these autonomy and connection. So autonomy is like self-empowerment needs, you know, freedom, choice, uh, self-empowerment, this kind of thing. And connection needs is you know, connection, love, affection, companionship, belonging. So we need to arrive at a way of being in which I feel that I'm, essentially I'm loved and accepted for who I am. So again, these the deep core beliefs that we really want to get established here as a young child. I belong here. I'm loved and accepted by others for who I am. I love and accept myself for who I am. My freedom and choice will be honored. And what I have to offer is valued. So what, so, so that's kind of the idea of a healthy development of the cell. So let's actually look at what can go wrong. So I think it's helpful here to look at ourselves as we're essentially holistic systems. All, all living organisms um, I see as sort of being comprised of living systems which are embedded within other living systems. So if we look at a human being, essentially we have a physiological system, a psychological system, social transpersonal, spiritual, and environmental, ecological are kind of, the, kind of the main systems that I think are really important to our well-being. And if we experience significant overwhelming distress on any one of these systems, that can kind of throw our entire organismic um, being into a state of disarray, into a state of chaos. And essentially, we, we can arrive at a state in which our existence just does, no longer feels tenable. It just doesn't feel sustainable. You know, I can't tolerate it anymore. Um, and if this is a point where and, this, and what I and others have, have believed, on a deep level, this being initiates a psychotic process as a way to transform the experience of, of the self at this very deep level from an experience that's just not working, that's overwhelming, to one that hopefully will work. And it's a very haphazard, chaotic process, obviously, to transform oneself at such a deep level. And it often doesn't work well at all, but sometimes it actually works amazingly. I've seen that many times, really found transformations of people go through such a process. So I, I hold a holistic systems perspective when I look at psychosis and what causes it. Um, but what's particularly important is our upbringing and our, our, and our family, because that's where we develop the experience of self, essentially, is within our family system. So that's why I'm kind of emphasizing that here. So what goes wrong in psychosis? So again, there's this experience of overwhelm for whatever reason. And a very deep overwhelm, and as a result of that, the very foundation of self essentially gets undermined. So we find the relational dialectic gets unstabilized, and then even below that, the existential dialectic. So at, these, at these levels, we're, ex we're not experiencing these as being resolved. So I'll say a little bit about that. So when the existential dialectic, this really core experience, this need to experience myself as relatively secure and stable, living in a secure and predictable world, I'm not able to experience that now. Um, and so essentially, I'm not able to experience both enough peace and enough sort of valued existence, meaningful existence, to, to tolerate my existence. And the core beliefs that go along with this are, I don't have a right to exist, to take up space. The world's not safe enough. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. And then one layer up, the relational dialectic, when, when this is, is unresolved, this is undermined, uh, we're not able to arrive at a way of being in which I feel that I'm loved and accepted for who I am. So we, f we fail to achieve that balance of both healthy autonomy and healthy connection. So the core needs, um, core beliefs, I mean, that kind of go with this, or I don't belong here, I'm not loved and accepted for who I am, I'm ashamed of who I am, I have to sacrifice myself to be accepted by others, and I have to fight for my freedom and my power. <clears throat> so... If we kind of consider, again, people go through such extreme states, and I, I spent a lot of time looking at the research, these are the kinds of core beliefs that come up again and again. As far as the factors that make us vulnerable to this, um, you know, there's, you'll find in the field, the mainstream field really kind of pushes genetic factors and biological factors, et cetera. Um, but if you actually look closely at the research, what you find is, at best, you might find a 25% sort of increase in likelihood of developing psychosis correlating with some particular biological vulnerability, et cetera. But when we look at the psychosocial factors, like 
you find enormously greater um, impact. And I'll say a little, I'll just give a little research in a minute. But generally what we find is the psychosocial factors which are correlated with the development of psychosis are so far have been far, far higher than anything you find in the biological research. And these are the factors that, sh that have really shown up in quite a robust way. Uh, prenatal stress and poor health, early attachment issues, childhood physical abuse, childhood sexual abuse, uh, childhood physical neglect, childhood emotional neglect, parental loss, bullying, so that's either by siblings or, or um, peers at school, usually. Poverty, urban living, target of racism, um, so oppression in general, sexual assault, physical assault, and exposure to combat. So these have all been strongly correlated with the later onset of uh, psychosis. And I've just sort of reorganized this for the purpose of looking at it from a family point of view. Um, so on the left are the ones, the, the same factors, which are directly internal to that family system. So you can see, of course, the child, various kinds of childhood abuse and neglect, attachment issues, uh, prenatal uh, problems with the, you know, the mother um, while pregnant with a child, stress and poor health, and then sibling bullying. And then on the right side are, are external factors, but they still often impact the family system. Peer bullying, poverty, different kinds of oppression, um, and uh, sexual and physical assault. So I'm just going to give, um, I'm just going to basically show two research studies. There's, there's so many research studies that really kind of validate um, what I've just described, but um, there's two in particular in recent years that, that really kind of emphasize this. So uh, in 2004, there was a Dutch study that looked at over 4,000 young people, adolescents, um, and young adults, and they followed them for three years. So these were 4,000 people who initially were, were healthy, they weren't experiencing psychosis. They just followed them for three years just to see who would develop this and who wouldn't. Um, those who experienced child abuse were nine times more li likely to go on to develop psychosis, and those of, um, who experienced the most severe level of child abuse were 48 times more likely to develop psychosis. And then another study came out in the UK uh, in 2007. So this was essentially going over a very broad database of 8,500 uh, people and just looking at correlations between adverse childhood experiences. So this study wasn't just about child abuse. This was more broad. This was more like the list I just showed with the different kinds of, of adverse childhood experiences. And what they found that for those people who had three types of adverse childhood experiences, they were 18 times more likely than the average person to develop psychosis. And those who had five times of trauma were 193 times more likely to develop psychosis. Uh, so this is this is really incredible, and it's just so so many times stronger than any kind of correlations that we find in, in the biological research. Now, as we're kind of looking at <clears throat> development, so we're, we're, the frame here is looking at development of the self and how that can kind of go wrong, and how when that does go wrong, that can contribute to psychosis. It seems that there's two very critical periods of development that really show up. The first. Um, I'm going to just call child individuation. So this is essentially the first two to three years of life. And this is when the child is really going through that, kind of, that very vulnerable state of starting to separate self and other. That, so that's that kind of childhood individuation of, be, of becoming to experience a distinct sense of self from other. And along with that, developing relational styles with other people. And what we find is when children are really supported with, with those dialectics I mentioned above, when they feel safe and welcomed and, and their autonomy and connection needs are, are well enough met, they almost always develop secure attachment styles. And when they develop secure attachment styles, <clears throat> they're likely to find that future relationships with friends and romantic partners, et cetera, are going to go pretty easily, pretty smoothly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Now, if they don't get these basic kind of needs met in those early years, so again, there's an existential relational dialectic, they don't feel safe, they don't feel welcome, they don't feel like both autonomy and connection needs are, are well enough met, and they're likely to develop insecure attachment styles, and this is likely to lead to ongoing problems with relationships down the road, and it's also been significantly correlated with a higher likelihood of developing psychosis uh, later on, usually in adolescence and, and uh, early adulthood. The second really critical developmental period is, is adult individuation. So this is where this takes place in, we kind of see the first stirrings of it in adolescence, but then as we get to late adolescence, early adulthood, uh, this is where this really takes place. There's a natural, healthy, 
push and pull um, towards essentially separating from the parent and the parent is as a primary attachment figure and, and instead attaching usually to a romantic partner or a more peer-oriented attachment figure. So the health, that's what healthy individuation would consist of. Healthy adult individuation, that is. And, but if that doesn't go well um, for various reasons, and what we find the person failures to make that transition, they, fail, they, they maintain a certain degree of dependency on their parents or, or maybe some other systems, um, they, they, failure, they fail to successfully transition to more peer-oriented or romantic-oriented attachment figures, so they, they stay kind of in, embedded within, the, um, often within relationships with the initial primary, you know, mother, father, within that initial system, they have a really hard time separating from that. Um, and along with that is psychological and emotional turmoil and increased potential for psychotic breakdown. So there's, it, it's very, very well established that most people experience the first episode of psychosis in late adolescence and early adulthood. There are exceptions, but the vast majority of people experience it then. And what I've seen again and again and again is in the vast majority of cases that I've seen in research and, and in my clinical practice, is I see this problem here, that the, the person is failing to individuate successfully. And you know, it's chicken or the egg, are they having psychosis first, and is that making it hard to individuate, or is it the individuation problem itself? And so it's something worth exploring, but uh, there's, I think there's no doubt that this is very relevant uh, towards psychosis. So having that basic frame now, we can kind of think about recovery from psychosis, essentially consists of establishing a secure foundation of the self. So this, this foundation of the self is very insecure, has become undermined. I mean, people who have these experiences, myself included, describe it often as have, feeling like the carpet just gets ripped right out from under your whole experience of self in the world. It's, it's very destabilizing. It really can feel like just the bottom getting ripped out. So recovery is actually helping us, helping kind of reinforce and support the foundations. And so going back to these earlier slides quickly, you know, helping the, supporting that person in developing a healthy um, existential dialect, a healthy balance between peace and security on one hand, but also a valued and meaningful existence on the other hand. I have a right to exist, to take up space, a world is safe enough, fundamentally whole and healthy. So these are the kinds of beliefs you want to support the person in establishing. And then above that, the relational dialectic, supporting people and meeting their autonomy and connection needs and really feeling both of those well enough met. So helping them really come to believe deeply in their being, you know, that I do belong here, I am loved and accepted for who I am, I love myself, I accept myself for who I am, my freedom and choice will be honored by others, and what I have to offer is valued. <clears throat> so that's kind of the frame that I'm going to basically just set for kind of looking at psychosis and recovery and just offering a broad frame there. And then this last little piece I'm going to go through is kind of the role of family and, and resilience and recovery. So um, basically supporting, so often family members uh, play a key part in supporting people, because usually these are young people that go through these experiences, and supporting them in their recovery and developing resilience. And the first thing, obviously, that, you know, starting, if we can start very early with a child, long before the problem happens, um, that's the best thing. Um, However, of course, we don't always have that opportunity that child, you know, adolescent or young adult has a breakdown and we can't go back and change our parenting styles. But it's still important to think about parenting styles because obviously the earlier we can really have healthy parenting styles, the better. But even, even later, we can still bring the same kind of principles of these parenting styles in as we support, you know, a, a loved one going through this process. So this is a basic um, kind of diagram of different parenting styles as we generally, as most kind of people in this uh, psychological and social field today understand them. So there's two axes here. There's an acceptance and the control um, axis. And the acceptance one basically goes, it correlates directly to what I'm calling connection, and the control correlates directly to what I'm calling autonomy. So remember that autonomy, connection, dialectic, that, that relational dialectic. So as a parenting style, what we're really trying to do is support them in developing healthy autonomy and healthy uh, connection with others. And so on the top right, the authoritative parenting style is where both of these are, are well established. So when, when we use the word control here, this isn't about power over control, this is about power with control. This is actually about supporting the child in developing their own and learning how to develop a healthy autonomy and learning how to actually set their own healthy limits 
how to regulate their own emotions, this kind of thing. So that's when we use a control here, that's what we're referring to it on the authoritative side. And then um, acceptance in this case, so an authoritative style would make it very clear that the child is loved for who they are. Uh, limits are set, but they're set in a way that is very collaborative, there's clear communication, and supporting the child and eventually setting their own limits as much as possible. And the way this actually looks is, is usually we start in, uh, in early childhood when there's not that much verbal communication sort of available to us. Um, they call it attachment parenting, which is just essentially putting all emphasis in bonding with that child. Just really letting that child know that they're cared and loved for. Um, you know, that really deep, early, safe, welcome uh, existential dialectic. And then as they get older and we're able to communicate with them more, um, then we sh you know, shift to more and more of a democratic style here. So more and more communication, collaboration. Um, still, obviously, willing to set limits as necessary to maintain safety, et cetera. But again, we're collaborating with the child and how he sets his limits. Now the other, if we go to the left side to contrast, so the upper left, this is where there's high control, but now it's more of a power over control. So, and, and there's less acceptance. So an authoritarian style, there's a lot of power over um, rather than power with. And abusing, there's that power over and very low acceptance. If we come down to the bottom left, we have neglecting parenting style. So, and this is kind of neither. There's really neither much control, kind of just letting the child do what they want. So you're not really supporting them in developing healthy autonomy. And then the bottom right, permissive, there may be a lot of nurturance and acceptance, a lot of connection needs. So it's just kind of helpful to think about these parenting styles. And, and if we are parents or caretakers for someone, either a child or someone, maybe an adult, but they're in a dependent state, you know, try, how can we work towards a more authoritative and democratic way of supporting this person? Uh, and then as far as a, a relational frame, so this applies again whether we're parents, whether we're caretakers, therapists, whatever role we might be, whenever we're supporting someone going through extreme states, I, I think that these kind of five points are really key, key relational points to hold in that frame. So the first one is I kind of already alluded to, power with rather than power over. Obviously there's a space for setting healthy limits, um, but we're really striving to have a power with collaborative relationship with this person being open and curious about each person's perspectives, feelings, and needs. So we all have a tendency, of course, to be biased to my own perspective. And this is a willing to, to do our best to be open-minded and wondering, huh, what's it like for this person? And what is it like from their eyes, from their perspective? And what is it that they're feeling and what is it that they're needing? It's really kind of framing that. And the other one is communicating in a congruent way. So we communicate with both words and actions. And actually, it's nonverbal communication. So there's a lot of interesting research on this. Verbal communication with words is actually the, the least amount of communication we were actually doing when we interact with people. The nonverbal is actually much more important. Tone of voice, facial expression, and, and you know, our actions are, are generally come through much more strongly than our words. And if we communicate in a way that's not congruent, our actions or our tone of voice or expression is saying one thing and our words are saying something different, that, that's very confusing and, and can really lead to a lot of problems in the relationship. The other one is balancing nourishing connection and personal space. So you know, all human beings, we all need a balance here. And then there's a, kind of that autonomy connection piece again. You know, we all need a certain amount of personal space. Uh, and we also need nourishing connection. And, and just really holding that for ourselves and holding that for the other who we're supporting, making sure that balance is there. And then finally, trying to repair any harm done. So generally, whenever there's extreme states, there's often harm done on both sides. Well, first of all, just as human beings, I mean, whenever it's almost impossible not to occasionally harm each other, do things that hurt each other in some way. Um, but it's particularly true when someone's going through extreme states and these kinds of conditions where there can be a lot of harm done in both directions. So just really a kind of an ongoing part of the work is, is, is repairing that as you go. So th this is kind of a frame I think is so helpful to hold. And I'm just going to kind of go over, a, a, I'm going to go into some more subtle aspects of this now. <clears throat> So part of this frame is shifting from seeing a person as just simply crazy or psychotic or diseased brain to huh, maybe you know they're actually like a canary in a, in a troubled coal mine. In the same way that a canary is used by miners, I don't know if it still is, but it has in the past, used by miners because they're very sensitive to toxic fumes and, and they exhibit uh, problems or often I guess they die in that case a lot, but they exhibit the toxicity before the miners experience it. In the same way... People in a family system, there's, there's some people that are just simply more sensitive than others. 
So it doesn't necessarily mean they have something wrong with them or that they have something wrong with their brain. When they start having these experiences, often what it simply means is very sensitive. That there's something going on in the family system or the larger, broader systems that's, that's problematic. And then this person is just simply manifesting that first, being the most kind of sensitive one. So just holding that frame, being curious about that. Huh, how might this problem be connected to the broader family system or, or maybe even the larger social systems, you know, the school or workplace or, or society at large? And then shifting <clears throat> from attitude of blame to shared responsibility. So it's, it's just in my opinion and what I've seen again and again working with families myself and pointing fingers and assigning blame, it just doesn't help. I mean, even if someone actually has, you know, there is a place for someone to be accountable or whatever for a particular action they did, simply just pointing it in a critical way usually just makes the person more defensive and, and it just doesn't, it doesn't really help the problem. <clears throat> so, so rather than thinking about this from a blame, it's your fault, it's her fault, it's my fault. Instead, going, you know what, we're all part of this social system, and in some way or another, we all contribute to it. So there's this problem happening. If there's a problem in one individual, then how might I be contributing to this? So again, not, not self-blame, not self-critical, but just open-minded. Huh, what might I be doing? How might I be contributing? So really holding that open question. And this involves also loosening tendencies, you know, rigid thinking, right, wrong, good, bad. So kind of loosening that up and being willing to just be generally more open in a moralistic sense and more willing to, you know, again, look at other people's perspectives. Uh, and along with this is, is being curious about intergenerational baggage. So, you know, we're all raised in families ourselves. And that when we're raised in that family, we pick up certain beliefs about the world. We pick up certain behaviors, attitudes. And we often don't even realize that we're doing so. It's kind of like the idea of, you could say a fish isn't even aware of water because that's all the fish has ever known. In the same way, we often have these same beliefs, behaviors, and we're not even aware of them because we've been immersed with them since our own childhood. And we're actually passing them down. We don't even know we're doing this. So this being curious about how, how, what baggage might I have been taking with me from, from my childhood that I'm actually now just carrying down to my own children. Just being really, again, not from a blame or self-critical place, but an open, curious place. How might I be contributing to the problem by just carrying this baggage along? Um, and also, finally, as, as parents and caretakers, we do, even though we, we want to come from a shared responsibility place, we do need to acknowledge that there is a power differential. Most social systems do have power differentials. Some members simply have more power than others. Power means the capacity, essentially, to create change, and that change can be, or, or to influence the system, and that change can be either very constructive and helpful or it can be very destructive. So when we're parents and caretakers, we simply generally have more power and we have the capacity to do more harm or benefit. And we just need to acknowledge that. We do have that power differential. We just need to hold that gently and, and humbly. So, so I'm shifting now just actual kind of key relational skills. So those are kind of frame, a framework of how I think it's helpful to, to frame our relationship with other people and social systems. Now just these are some actual practical skills. And I actually draw a lot of this from what's, um, what's called nonviolent communication. Some of you might be aware of that. And it's, uh, it's a system I've used for many years. And it's one of the main systems that I use, communication systems with families and couples. And I think it's great. I think it's one of the best systems I've come across. It's very simple and it's, it's very, very effective. So this first piece is about skillful self-expression. So something's not working for me in this relationship or whatever, and I need to try to express that to this person. And what's important is that I express it in a way where they don't just simply get defensive or angry, but they're actually able to hear me and where hopefully we can maybe do something about it. So in order to do that, first of all, I need to actually distinguish what did I actually observe? What did that person say or do? as opposed to what is my own interpretation. If I just simply blurt out my sort of evaluation of the person or my interpretation, it's likely to make that person uh, just get defensive and, and they're going to shut down. But if instead I go, you know what, hey, I observed this happened. You know, you said such and such or you did this. I'm actually just stating a fact. So I'm not, I'm not saying something that's likely to get the person triggered. So that's kind of the first step. And then from there I go into, okay, when this happened, now I'm talking about myself. You know, this has how it affected me. It, I felt like this, and you know, these particular needs weren't met, or you know, I was kind of, I'm kind of wanting this. So I'm talking about myself. I'm not saying you, you, you. I'm saying I, I, I. And so again, this is less likely to put them on the defense because I'm just talking about me at this point. And then the next one is request versus demand. So I'm actually at this point, you know, I've, I've explained this is what's going on, this is how it's affecting me. No, 
rather than saying you need to do such and such, coming with a demand energy, because that almost always will meet a brick wall, we come with request energy. So hey, would you be willing to, you know, talk about this or would you be willing to try, you know, do something differently and you know, open up dialogue about the situation? So kind of those first three are just so key, I think, to helpful self-expression. Um, and then part of this, too, is setting clear limits and boundaries is necessary. You know, I do have to take care of myself, and if someone's behavior isn't working for me, you know, I do need to set some limits around that, whether I need to remove myself from the situation or, or seek other kinds of support. Okay, so continuing on here with the idea of key relational skills. So I just talked about uh, self, uh, skillful self-expression. So now we're going to kind of talk about the other side of that of, of, of relationship, which is empathy. So self-expression, I'm, I'm trying to share what's going on for me in a skillful way, in a way where the other person is most likely to be able to receive that without becoming defensive or shut down. Skillful empathy is where I actually make a conscious choice. I'm going to temporarily set aside my stuff, my beliefs, my feelings, my needs, etc., my wants. I'm going to set those on a shelf. So I'm not actually I'm not invalidating them or I'm not under, you know, taking them away. I'm just going to set them over there for a moment so that I can be 100% present with this person in front of me. And, and with this presence, the relationship here is very important, the attitude. So it's important that I, I am open, have a genuine openness and curiosity about what is going on for this person. So if I'm, if I'm kind of trying to give empathy or be empathetic, but I'm coming from an ulterior motive, I'm trying to kind of convince them of my perspective or, um, or maybe be like critical, it's, it's probably not going to go over very well. So I really need to check in with myself and go, okay, can I actually be genuinely open here and really literally set myself aside for a minute and really put myself in this person's shoes? That's, that's key. And when I do that, when I put myself in this person's shoes, what I'm actually kind of asking for, what I'm looking for, is help me understand, like, what, what is your perspective? How are you understanding the situation? How are you experiencing the situation? What are the feelings that are getting evoked for you here in this situation? And what is it that you're needing? And what, 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 what is some important maybe values or needs or wants um, that you know really aren't working out for you so well? And just help me understand that. So that's essentially the essence of empathy. And in my experience, it is really the number one most important relational skill to be able to use. It's also important to acknowledge that we can't always use it. Sometimes we're just too triggered ourselves. Uh, and at that point, when we just can't offer genuine open curiosity to the person, I'm so self, you know, protective myself in this moment or hurt myself, I might need to just take a break and then, you know, kind of gather myself and then come back when I feel that I can actually give this person genuine empathy. So the other important relational skill is shifting from multiple monologues to open dialogue. So most of us can probably relate to the idea that often in relationship, there's uh, two or more people, especially when things get a bit heated and charged, there's two or more people each really holding tight to their own perspective. And they really want the other people to understand. The problem is everybody's doing that. So there's nobody, there's no ears available. There's no one actually available to really listen. So you have lots of people giving monologues, multiple monologues, and but no actual dialogue, no give and take, give and receive, give, you know, exchange occurring. So what's important here is to recognize as long as we don't, as long as we stay in multiple monologues, we may as well all be screaming at brick walls. There's just not going to be much movement here. And, and if anything, just increase and deepen the resentment. So to shift to open dialogue, first of all, I, I have to genuinely recognize that there may be some value in these other people's perspectives. I mean, sure, you know, I have my own perspective, and, and I might be attached to that in some way, but everybody else here, they have a different perspective that I simply, it's simply unique, and there's probably some wisdom in there that I can learn from. Um, additionally, practice easygoing in the not knowing. So this is about a bit of humility, being willing to sit in the unknown, being willing to recognize maybe I don't have the whole picture, you know, can I actually be open to other perspectives and maybe I can actually learn something uh, and broaden my own perspective. Uh, and then finally, bringing this practice in in kind of a ritualized way can be very helpful. Um, just again, because we often get so charged and if we just try to practice open dialogue without a clear structure or container, it, it often falls apart. So one way to do this is simply using a mediator or a therapist who's skilled in, in doing, you know, supporting people and basic open dialogue work. And when I use open dialogue work here, I'm using it generically, not, not um, as the formal therapeutic modality from Finland, although certainly there's a lot of overlap because that modality, the way I understand it, does really value open dialogue as I'm discussing it here. But as I'm discussing it here, this is uh, basically just in the general sense, you know, just generally having open dialogue. So the other kind of ritualized way of using this um, 
it's often referred to as intentional dialogue. And it's actually quite simple. You just take a speaking object, anything will work. And essentially this represents the speaker. Whoever's holding the object is the speaker, and the other person or, or people are the listeners and reflectors. So as long as I'm the speaker, I, I share whatever's going on for me. And the reflectors, their job is just simply to reflect whatever I'm saying. And they can use their own words, but um, I hold the stick until I really feel that they got it, that they understand me. So I can kind of correct them or maybe add a little bit, but eventually there comes a point when, okay, I think they understand me now. And then I hand the speaking object to the listener, um, or if there's more than one, you can kind of go around with it. Um, and then I become the reflector once they hold the object. And you just take turns like this. This can be an extremely helpful skill to practice. Um, so the other thing about relational skills is the so key is about relational repair, relationship repair. So first of all, it's again going back to that kind of humble place. You know, I'm a human being. We're all we're, we all have our vulnerabilities and errors of judgment, and we all do things that hurt each other at times. It just happens, intentionally or not. Um, so first of all, just recognizing that. And and when I do something that causes a loved one or, or someone else pain, again, regardless of my intention, in the, if, if they experience pain. It really helps for me to, to take some responsibility for that because they're going to be in a position of being hurt and protective, and so I'm actually the one that's most likely to be able to do the repair, to initiate repair. And this essentially consists of offering genuine empathy. Again, setting myself aside, listening to the person. You know, okay, I, I see that was really hurtful for you. Can you just help me understand? You know, what it was about what I said or did that was hurtful. You know, what were the feelings that showed up for you? What, what are the needs that, that weren't met or were undermined? you know, as a result of what I said or did. So really just trying to get it. Okay, that's what it was like for you. And then once they feel hurt, most people, when they really feel genuinely hurt like this, they'll, they will soften up and they'll open. And most likely they'll be, afterwards, um, they'll be available to listen to, to you, listen to the person who did the harmful thing, um, and, and understand what might have been going on for you when, when you did or said whatever it was. Um, but if you try to start with justifying or, you know, explaining yourself or this kind of thing, it almost always just hits a brick wall and makes things worse. So it's really important to start with empathy, and then once they feel hurt, then I can go ahead and maybe try to explain what was going on for me when I did the harmful thing. Um, and, and this can be a very sensitive process, so it can often help to use a skilled mediator or therapist. Uh, I do a lot of this work myself in my practice. Another thing about relational skills is healthy distancing. So this goes back to that autonomy connection dialectic. We all have autonomy needs, you know, choice, freedom, personal space, personal empowerment, and we all have connection needs, intimacy, friendship, companionship, support, et cetera, love. And so, so we, 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 when we're doing relational skill building and work, we want to make sure not to neglect the autonomy side. So we, we need, when we're living with someone or spending a lot of time with someone, we do need to make sure that there's periods of, of kind of balancing intimate connection, nourishing connection with personal space. It's just, it just really needs to be in there. Or we tend to, tend to get a bit of cabin fever and resentful and this kind of thing. And then the uh, second piece here is, is when things get really bad, oftentimes a relationship is just not working and, and I can't figure out how to make this work, there can definitely be a place for a prolonged or even a complete separation. Uh, you know, this, right now this relationship is causing more harm to you and me than, than benefit. You know, maybe we just need to actually take a break from each other for a while. Uh, there can definitely be a place for that. So as, as someone who's offering this kind of support to people going through extreme states, it's important to um, take care of yourself. So this kind of goes back to the, kind of the cliche about the oxygen mask on, on the airplane. Make sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help your neighbor put their oxygen mask on. So if we don't have our oxygen mask on, you know, we're not going to be in any kind of position to support someone else. And it's the same thing here. We, we need to take care of ourselves first, and it's not, it's not selfishness. It's, I mean, on one hand, you could call it selfish in the sense that you know, we're each responsible to take care of ourselves. But if I don't take care of myself, I can't really support others very well. So really making sure I have regular fun and recreation in my life, regular physical movement and exercise, and regular rest, making sure that these, and, and alternative sources of, of social connection. These are really important. Uh, and then also doing self-connection work. It can get really messy supporting someone in extreme stakes conditions. The whole relationship can end up getting really enmeshed, or it can get really quite messy. We can really lose our sense of self in the whole process. Uh, maybe we never really had a clear sense of self in the relationship in the first place. And so it's important, going back to that autonomy connection dialectic, 
I'm going to really support this person and develop a healthy relationship with this person and help them learn how to relate to other people in a healthy way. It's going to really help for me to, to first of all, model that by, by practicing clear self-connection, setting healthy limits and boundaries for myself, uh, and be able to, to actually manifest that in relationship with this other person. So I'm not losing sight of myself as I connect with this person. And things like journaling, um, people often find very helpful journaling. This could be either in verbal form, like writing, or a lot of people journal in art forms, doing um, expressive artwork and this kind of thing, or, or you know, some kind of artistic form. Mindfulness is something that, that I use a lot. It's been really important in my own practice, both in my own personal recovery and supporting others, um, or other contemplative practice that involves self-connection in some way. And then um, finally, individual <coughs> counseling or therapy is often extremely uh, helpful. So actually taking the time to just kind of work with someone one-on-one -on -one yourself to kind of, you know, again, help that self-connection. Uh, and then finally, not being afraid to seek support. You know, we all have our limits. And if we exceed those limits of what we can actually tolerate, and we all have those, and we keep trying to push on, we can often just make things a lot worse. So it, it is important to recognize, you know what, I think this situation is getting beyond what I can actually manage. And then being, you know, contacting family therapist, mediator, other kinds of social services, social support that we feel would be helpful. Um, and this is also where I highly recommend taking a communication course yourself uh, and encouraging you know, the loved one, however, to, to, to do this kind of work as well. Um, so nonviolent communication is something I'm a big fan of. I, I teach it. I do a bit of teaching, and I use it with almost all my clients to some degree. Uh, it's really served me. And what I really like about it is very simple. And it's very common sense. It's just about connecting to my own feelings and needs and supporting others and connecting to their feelings and needs and, and holding, you know, um, not, you know, letting go of demand energy and holding a sense of choice and, and making requests and this kind of thing. And it's quite effective. And it's, uh, and it's quite, quite short to learn. So generally there's an eight-week course, two hours um, a day for eight, over eight uh, sessions. Over eight weeks is usually how it's taught. But you can go online and Google it and um, you'll find them all over country and even the world, and there's even um, online uh, courses that you can take as well. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of in an overview of uh, you know, supporting family members and loved ones. And if you haven't already done so and you would like more information, you can go to my website, rethinkingmadness.com. Uh, and then I have a kind of personal blog and article page there, and I, you'll find the number of my articles um, videos, and there's also a link to the actual article um, called Madness the Family, which this presentation is based on. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Uh, thank you.